Okay, yeah, so we're going to be talking about microservices and so a bit about microservices in general and also the technology behind them. And as you'd expect, because this is a MongoDB conference, we'll also be covering uh, how MongoDB interacts. So this is the agenda. As I say, we'll introduce microservices, look at some of the technologies, in particular containers, with the most famous of those being Docker. Uh, we'll also look at Kafka, which is one of the ways of passing information between your containers. Orchestration, so when you've got lots of containers, plugging them together and making everything work nicely. How you use it with MongoDB. Interestingly, when you should use microservices and when you might not want to. And finally, we'll close with some use cases and look at how um, some of our customers not necessarily how they're using microservices and MongoDB, but what motivated them to use that combination. So microservices, definition of microservices, it's where you build a potentially sophisticated application out of a number of small, discrete software uh, components. And each of those software components, they communicate with each other, but they communicate with each other through well-defined APIs. And so the software within each uh, container or component is very isolated from the others. Why use microservices? Because it's cool. Uh, so, so most of you probably heard the term web scale, and it's certainly been used in the context of MongoD MongoDB. So microservices, they were originally called micro web services. And it's some of the huge web properties started adopting this kind of architecture as a way to really scale out um, both how quickly they can roll out their software and also how large they can scale it to be. So some of the, some of the motivations. Speed, getting the minimal, val the minimal valuable um, product out as soon as possible. One of the things, one of the characteristics of building with microservices is you don't kid yourself that on day one you're going to come up with this architecture that is going to last for the next 15 years. It's, it's around change, so you accept, we're going to knock something together, we'll put it out, see how it performs. And because of this architecture, we can swap components in and out very quickly. So the fact we made a mistake in the first one, and we've got to change the way we render uh, sort of stock prices on this page, it's not a problem, because you've just got to update a single microservice that does that rendering. So that makes it e also easy to deploy stuff. So in addition to just having to change the code in that one component, you can just push out the change to that component without touching anything else. And that's why you get uh, a lot of companies using these architectures. They may redeploy new versions of their application several times a day. They're certainly not waiting you know, on a six-month or an 18-month release schedule. They're constantly pushing these out. And it does help you scale. And we'll see some examples of that. But basically, you can decide that this particular layer in my application, I need to scale out. So I'll just add more instances of containers or components for that layer. And then finally, it empowers development teams. Because individual development teams, they own their set of uh, microservices. And they don't have to go to any committee or any other team if they want to make a change within that microservice. All they need to do is that all the users of that microservice are happy with the API that they're providing. So what came before microservices? So monolithic applications or spaghetti code? So in the 90s and earlier, this is how people would build their applications. And they may have started off fairly elegant with a well-defined architecture. But over years, people take shortcuts to try and get a change out quickly. Now, whenever you make a change to a single line of code, it could be breaking 15 other places. So that means when you do make a change, you've got to do a huge amount of extra integration testing, extra system testing, just to make sure that the whole thing still works as you'd expect. And this is why this kind of system, it can take months and months between each release, just because you've got to test so much. It's also not good from an architectural perspective, because you may have one developer who understands all of this code base. And so 
he or she is the only person who's actually able to understand the consequences of a particular change. And so you're really bottlenecking on that one person or a small number of people. So how does microservices change? Microservices are more like cupcakes. So I'm going to stretch this metaphor as much as I possibly can. So the kind of things you can do, uh, from an organization perspective, you can have a particular chef who is an expert at making chocolate cupcakes. They haven't got a clue about strawberry ones, but they can make the best chocolate cupcakes. And they understand everything there is about making chocolate cupcakes. You could suddenly realize that there's a better strawberry flavor uh, icing that you could make. And so you want now to have uh, all of your strawberry cupcakes using this extra special strawberry uh, icing. So what you can do is you can just remove all of your existing strawberry cupcakes and add in new ones using the new recipe. It doesn't affect any of the other cupcakes. So it's a very safe thing to do. You may decide that no one's actually buying blueberry cupcakes anymore. So you can just drop those out altogether. But you may also realize that now everyone seems to be eating green cupcakes. And so you just add more of those. So you scale those independently of the rest. But what does that mean in terms of software? In this diagram, every one of the ovals is a microservice. And we're following the best practice here that each microservice has got a very focused, a very well-defined, a very constrained responsibility. So the four on the outside, each one is responsible for ingesting messages from a particular social network. And then they're feeding that over the network to another microservice in the middle that's uh, merging all of those feeds together. One day may come along and you realize that a particular social network isn't as popular as it used to be, so we don't need that anymore. So you just remove that. The rest of the system continues working as you'd expect. Conversely, you hear that this, there's this hot new application that's coming along. And you just implement a completely new microservice that all it knows how to do is ingest messages from, from WhatsApp. Another thing you could do is realize that Snapchat is really getting hot. And so I need more instances of my Snapchat microservice to ingest, ingest all of the traffic from there. And also, obviously, by having multiple instances of the same microservice, that also gives you some redundancy. So you can tolerate any one of those uh, containers or microservices failing, and you're still able to ingest messages from uh, every one of your social networks. Thinking about organization a little. So this is one of the fundamental, trendy uh, laws of microservices. So any organization that designs a system will inevitably produce a design whose structure is a copy of the organization's communication structure. And the converse of that is that if your architecture doesn't reflect your organization, or the, the um, boundaries, the communication between those organizations doesn't work as it's designed, then you're going to have a poor product. The interesting thing is that this law was written in 1967. So it's amazing how things that were sort of have some real truth behind them sort of last the years and years. So just finishing off on the impact of development teams. So a best practice for a microservice is that a single microservice should be understandable by one designer. So any designer should be able to come along, look at a microservice, and understand what every line of code in there does. So in terms of size, that probably means that you're looking at hundreds of lines of code rather than tens of thousands of lines of code. There are exceptions to that. And some companies do build microservices that are tens of thousands of lines where, uh, for example, for the whole application, they may have four microservices. That may be OK for them. But what they need to consider is uh, which elements do they want to scale independently? Which ones do they want to upgrade independently? And also, how does it fit in with their organization? So uh, and, uh, yeah, final comments on this, just reinforcing 
it makes sense for the people that are developing a, particularly mic a particular microservice to be associated with the right part in the organization. So for example, if you've got a microservice that's going to generate uh, nurture track emails for the marketing department, it makes sense that if you've got a development team for the marketing department, they should write that microservice. You sh it, shouldn't be the it shouldn't be the IT department that's writing it. So now we start to go into some of the technologies that make up microservices. The first of those being containers. So we'll, we'll continue using um, stretched metaphors. And so we'll start off by looking at some real world containers, and in this case, shipping containers. So the great thing about shipping containers is why you see them everywhere is you can use the same container in multiple environments. So goods come out of the factory, you put them into a container, put them on the back of a lorry, ship them to the uh, railroad track, load them onto a train, they go to the port, you load them onto a uh, container ship, ship them to the other side of the world, and then reverse the process until they get to where they need to be. All the way through that process, you don't touch the contents of that container. Everything is just safely stored in there. So as there's no unpacking the box when you go from uh, rail to container ship, for example. Standardized, you can get them anywhere in the world. It's going to be the same shape, have the same capacity. Couldn't be simpler to use. You open the doors, put stuff in, close the doors. The, context are the contents are isolated and protected. So you could have a container full of Pepsi, and next to it, you've got a container full of Mentos and there's not going to be any kind of reaction between the two. And finally, you've got constraints. You can use them very efficiently, because when you're all, um, figuring out what you're going to put on a container ship, you know how uh, the exact dimensions of each one of these containers. And so you can very efficiently fill the space and know ahead of time exactly what space and what resource you're going to need for them. Moving on to software containers, a lot of similarities. With a software container, in particular Docker, you create an image. And the image defines what should go inside that container. So what operating system, what libraries, what application code. And once you've got that image, you can create hundreds, thousands, millions of containers. And they've all got the exact same software in, down to the latest patch level. You can use that container on your laptop, data center, in the cloud. You can use it during development, during QA, production support. Simple and efficient, and I'll go into some details as to why that is. You, you have isolation. So you, you have isolation at the namespace level, at the storage level, and at, at the networking level. So c code in different containers can only communicate with each other through well-defined network APIs. And finally, constraints. So you can put constraints, for example, using Linux C groups on a container, saying you're not going to use more than this amount of CPU, that amount of RAM, this, this much uh, disk I.O. And so again, you can put lots of them in a single host, knowing, knowing exactly what resources each one is going to use. This may sound a lot like virtual machines. So here, I'm going to explain why containers tend to be faster and more efficient than virtual machines. When you start at the bottom of the stack, they're absolutely identical. You've got the actual physical server they're running on, and you've got the host operating system. And then at the top of the stack, they both provide a service to the outside world. It's when you go for the middle layers that things become different. With a VM, you have a hypervisor. And then each VM has its own complete copy of an operating system. And obviously, that, that uses space. And also, when a line of your code runs, it's having to be translated from that guest operating system into the underlying uh, operating system through the hypervisor. With containers, you don't have that. You just have the, um, the actual engine for the container software itself, so in this case, Docker engine. And because when you're using uh, containers, each container actually uses the kernel of the operating system that the container is running on. And this is why, for years and years and years, uh, Docker would only run on Linux machines. So it, it now supports Windows and Mac OS. 
And a further efficiency is that, as well as sharing the operating system kernel, you can also share libraries and even some of your application code. So what does this mean in reality? It means that you need less storage, less memory, uh, less CPU, because you're not going through that translation level. Things run faster. And one thing that's really cool when you're playing with them is they're much faster to spin up. So when you spin up a, a Docker container, it's, it's almost instantaneous. So it's much, much faster than using a virtual box, for example, to spin up a, a VM. So I've mentioned Docker a few times. There's obviously different container technologies, but the one that's certainly getting the most press and is probably the most widely used by, by quite a way is Docker. It's simple to use. Uh, I'll show you how it's an example of how simple it, is, it can be to use. There's a great ecosystem in there. So if you go to Docker Hub, there's 100,000, actually more than 100,000 images, which you're free to use, and not just use them as is, you can use any one of them as a base to, to implement your own images. And then other people can build their images on top of yours. So for example, if you used a MongoDB image that you get from Docker Hub, and, and there is one, you could then decide, I also want to add uh, this middleware. Maybe I want to add Mongoose in there as well. So you just define your own image, which is based on Mongo, which is the name of the MongoDB one, but it also imports um, uh, Mongoose. Platforms, so as I say, it used to be Linux only. You can now run it on uh, Mac OS and Windows as well, and run it in lots of environments. And as well as being able to run it on uh, your laptop or EC2 instances, there's also cloud providers that effectively provide Docker as a service if you don't want to uh, look after that yourself. I mentioned simplicity, so this is just an extreme example. If you've got the Docker software installed on your laptop, Running this command is the only thing you need to do to spin up a container that's running MongoDB. If you've never run this before, it will automatically go to Docker Hub, download the Mongo image, and then create a container that, uh, that is, that's running MongoDB. You run it a second time, it knows it doesn't need to download the image again, and so it literally will be, you run this command, MongoDB is up and running inside a container. How many people recognize this container? Uh, just, just, a just the one. OK, so this is just to say that containers by themselves can be very useful and lovely things. So for example, if you just want to experiment with MongoDB on your laptop and you want to know you can just delete it easily afterwards, containers are a great thing. And this particular one is a bar from the Meantime Brewery, which is a, a brewery in Greenwich. And so this is a great example of a single container that provides a very useful um, function. But where things get really interesting is where you combine multiple containers together. So again, going back to the definition of microservice, here we've got many small focus containers building sophisticated services. And just like with software containers, so it, when you're connecting them together, as I've said before, you've got well-defined APIs. And with, uh, with software containers, it's sort of network-based APIs. Each container can use different programming languages, different sets of libraries. You can even use different versions of Linux. So they share the underlying Linux kernel with the, with the host, but you could have Fedora running, running on one, Ubuntu on, on another. Modular easy, easy maintenance and reuse. So in this example, uh, one of the bedrooms has a problem. You can just sort of remove it, add another one in. If you decide you need an extra bedroom, that's no problem. Just lower, lower another one in. Uh, and so that's combining real world containers to build um, sophisticated services. So when you've got these microservices, they can communicate directly with each other. So it's a network protocol. So one could just make a HTTP request to another, and that all works fine. But what if the microservice, the microservice that's meant to act on the message is unavailable for a time? Does that message get lost, or does the other microservice have to hold on to it? 
what if there's 20 other microservices that all want to receive all of the events from my green microservice? This is where a technology like Apache Kafka can come in. So uh, uh, Kafka was originally created by LinkedIn. And it's a, a distributed message queue. So here we've got the simplest thing you can have with Kafka, where you've got a single producer. It's writing events or messages to a topic or a message queue. And then we've got a single consumer that's reading them off. You can have multiple producers writing to the same topic. So for example, you could have multiple sources of uh, sensor data. And you can have multiple consumers reading messages from the topic. And those consumers can be at different points in time working through that message queue. So for example, here I could add a third consumer, which has never seen this message queue before. And it can catch up on everything that has happened since this topic was first created. Or you could upgrade one of these consumers. And when it rejoins uh, uh, Kafka, everything can be replayed through your new business logic. And so you process the whole of history based on the new version of your application. So there's a lot of flexibility with what you can do with that. You don't have to do that, but it's, it's an option that's available. Finally, um, well, not finally, but you can also scale it. As you, when we say it's a distributed message queue, you'd hope that you can scale it. So within a topic, you can partition the messages. And so you can have many uh, partitions, and the producers just write to them, and they'll, perform, uh, they'll choose a uh, partition based on some particular field within your message. For high availability, even for the same partition, you can have multiple brokers. And so the producer will write all of the changes to a leader, which will then replicate them to a follower. Uh, and similarly, the consumer will read all of the messages from the leader. And the final thing I'll say about uh, Kafka is I've been talking about having a topic. You can have multiple topics. And so in this example, say the, one of the consumers was uh, performing financial analysis. It may read messages from a stock ticker uh, topic, but it may also read from a Twitter topic to see what people are saying about a particular company, and then combine the two to figure out uh, what, what uh, investment decisions should be made. So that's containers and connecting them together. The next piece of technology is orchestration. So as you can imagine, you can end up with tens, hundreds, thousands, tens of thousands of uh, containers. Maybe you may have 50 Nginx containers, um, 20 MongoDB containers. They're going to communicate with each other in particular ways. So how, how are you going to automate that? And, and orchestration is the key way of doing that. And here you can see a list of some of the things that uh, can be done through orchestration. While with containers, Docker's got it pretty much sewn up, that, that tends to be what people are using. In the world of orchestration, there's a lot more choice. And so you won't necessarily see every orchestration framework implement all of these. And we're, we're just going to look at a, a, a couple today. The first is Kubernetes. It was originally created by Google. And you've probably noticed that this is a, a common thread in a lot of these uh, big open source projects that they started up being created by a company who had a, an internal need. And then as it grows and grows and grows, they decide that this is going to be useful to a wider community. So let's open source it. And in the case of Kubernetes, Google then donated it um, to another foundation. So they, they don't even own the software anymore. So Kubernetes is a very powerful orchestration framework. It probably comes with more features than most. So you can see a list here. Uh, deployment and replication, so actually spin up the containers in, in the right host. By replication, what I mean is, going back to the Nginx example, if you decide you want 20 containers running Nginx, you'll tell Kubernetes that, and it will make sure that there's always exactly 20. If one should fail, it will automatically uh, reschedule it and start it on potentially the same server or another server. You can also do online scale out. So you can now decide, I want 25 Nginx servers. It will create five. And now I only need 15. It'll remove 10. 
Best practices with containers is when you want to upgrade them, you don't actually upgrade the container. What you do is you effectively upgrade the image. So you come up with a new defini definition of your image, build a new image, shut down the old container, spin up a new one that's using the new image. And because you've got multiple instances of that, you can do that in a rolling way that, so you don't have an outage. And Kubernetes can implement that rolling upgrade for you. High availability, that's part of the replication I've talked about. Persistence. Docker containers are designed for stateless services. All of the data that's held within your container, if you restart that container, shut that container down, it's gone. So for applications like databases, that's not always what you want. And so Kubernetes adds something up in it on top of that called persistent volumes. And that's where the data is actually being stored outside of the container, but is effectively mounted on the container. So the container um, can read and write the data. But if that container dies and is rescheduled elsewhere, then you just uh, Kubernetes will remount that persistent volume, and it can immediately see the data. For MongoDB, this isn't strictly needed because you've got a replica set, you lose one replica, another one comes up, and it sort of it just synchronizes from the rest of the replica set. But that takes time. And so a best practice with MongoDB, if you're running MongoDB inside Kubernetes, would be to use these persistent volumes so you don't have to resynchronize. It can define the interfaces between the uh, containers, sort of basically by opening up ports. It can do load balancing. So you could have 20 containers of a particular type. And Kubernetes will provide a service running on top of that that presents a single IP address to the outside world. And whenever messages have come, come to that IP address, they're load balanced across all of those 20 containers. And if you add another five containers, it'll now load balance across all 25. If you do want to experiment with Kubernetes, it's got a bit of a reputation for while the, it's easy to use in terms of once, everything, once the infrastructure is there, setting up the infrastructure can be complex. And so the simplest way of using it is to actually use Google Compute Engine. So they're providing uh, Kubernetes as a service, effectively. And so you can get up and running very quickly and then figure out if it's um, right for you. Another maybe not quite so popular uh, if, um, orchestration framework, but is still widely used, is Apache Mesos. So the big claim to fame for Mesos is that it can scale to a ridiculous number of servers. And when you see the kind of companies that are using it, sort of in particular Twitter, where I think it started, you can kind of un imagine, OK, it's designed for that kind of scale. The downside of Mesos is it is harder to use. With Kubernetes, you just define a configuration file saying, this is what I want my uh, architecture to look like, and it will figure out how to implement it. With Mesos, you actually have to write code that turns your application into what Mesos calls a framework. The other downside is it doesn't provide as many features as Kubernetes. So it doesn't do rolling upgrades. It won't scale out. So you can't just say, I want five more containers. Uh, sort of, and I don't think it provides high availability either. So if you want those things, what you can do now is you can actually run Kubernetes as a framework running on top of Mesos. So Mesos gives you the ludicrous scalability. And then Kubernetes adds uh, the extra functionality on top. And your application runs um, within Kubernetes. So which one to choose? Uh, there's, there's no simple answer. But these are some of the things you might consider. What you've already got in your organization. So what skills? So if someone's already experienced in using Kubernetes, maybe a good idea. Have you got DevOps frameworks that it needs to fit in, some of your existing automation? Are you really you're going to use 10,000 hosts, or is it more likely to be 10? Uh, where do you want to run it? Also, life cycle. So a lot of people, so the, um, the Octopus logo there is uh, Docker Compose. So a lot of people, when they're actually wanting to build something 
in early development. They'll use Docker Compose because it's very easy. It's got quite a lot of functionality. And then later, before you go into production, you may decide, OK, I'll use something more industrial like uh, Mesos or Kubernetes. And of course, you should decide what features you actually need. So are you quite happy to implement high availability in your application, or do you want that done by the orchestration framework? Okay, so MongoDB conference. So finally, I get to talk about MongoDB a bit. So I'll start with, why is MongoDB a good fit for microservices? At this point, I'll maybe step back a bit, because we've kind of danced around the issue of whether MongoDB is actually running in microservices or not. Because I've already said that for years and years, it's been a well-established be best practice. You don't run databases in containers. And so that's definitely your first option, that you have your application logic and some of your middleware running as microservices in containers, but your database is separate from that. And it's running in a VM, or it's running on bare metal, running on EC2. And of course, run on MongoDB Atlas is the simplest possible way of doing it. And so that's a perfectly valid approach. But there are people who decide that, actually, I want some consistency. I'm running everything else inside a container. I want to run MongoDB inside a container, too. So for them, they've got two options. The first one is to go hardcore and actually use something like Kubernetes to manage MongoDB instances. And there, there are people that are doing that. And at the end, when we look at the use cases, uh, Fubo TV is an example. So there are people in production do, doing that. And to be fair, the orchestration frameworks and uh, Docker have been evolving because while it's an established best practice that you don't run your database in your containers, everyone wants to run their database in a container. And so if you go to a Docker conference or a Kubernetes conference now, the sessions on stateful services in containers, they're the ones that are packed out. So increasingly, people want to do it. So, so you could go all that way. Or somewhere in the middle is that you, you use either Ops Manager or Cloud Manager. And you use Kubernetes to make sure that the Ops Manager agent is running in each of the containers. And then you actually use Ops Manager or Cloud Manager to create and manage the MongoDB instances themselves. And so that way, you, you kind of get the best of both worlds. But anyway, having said that, why is MongoDB a good fit for microservices, whether within a container or outside of a container? First one, monitoring and automation. As you're probably picking up from this, you're going to have a huge number of uh, moving parts if you go this route. And so automating everything is vital and monitoring everything is vital. So even if you're using Kubernetes to manage your uh, MongoDB instances, Kubernetes doesn't know if you're um, using, to, you're, you know, you're about to start thrashing on cache or disk IO because something's going on inside your MongoDB database. So you still need that next level of monitoring to actually monitor the software, not just that there's a process there and the process hasn't died yet. Flexible data model, for the sake, we've went on and on about how users want to be able to evolve their application very quickly, not have to involve 15 departments if they want to add a new field. So obviously, the flexible data model with MongoDB is ideal for that. Redundancy, you've got all of these processes, all of these machines. You're not talking about machines might die. When you're starting to scale, machines will die. And you just have to accept that there's nothing exceptional about machines dying, especially if you're running in the cloud. And so MongoDB has got built-in redundancy with the replica sets. Scalability, you want to scale your architecture. Obviously, you can scale MongoDB by adding additional replica sets uh, using sharding. Simplicity. Again, even if you're not running MongoDB as a microservice itself inside a container, the best practice is that every microservice type has its own database. And so you could have a large number of MongoDB instances serving your microservices. And so if you're doing that, you want a database that's easy to use. And I think sort of after having worked with a few, I'm, I'm convinced that MongoDB is definitely one of the simplest to use. OK, so looking into a bit of a detail that you have made this decision that you are interested in running MongoDB inside of Docker 
being orchestrated by Kubernetes. I've already mentioned that you should use persistent volumes, which is something Kubernetes provides. When you're building a replica set, you want to make sure that you're using public external IP, well, at least external IP addresses for connecting those replica set members together. So things like Docker and Kubernetes, they have local IP addresses or local host names that you can use within the uh, Kubernetes cluster, uh, between, sort of within um, containers, et cetera. But the problem is that when a container gets rescheduled, those change. So, so you cannot rely on those. And so I'll show you a little um, not quite architectural diagram to, to show how you do that. But that's the key thing is you might be tempted to use internal host names. Don't do that. You use external ones. Kubernetes isn't going to do things like initializing your replica set. So you still have to have your own software that's going to do that. And similarly, it's not going to form shards by combining replica sets. And then I've already talked about the need for you to have good database monitoring and backups. They, they don't go away. Sort of Kubernetes isn't going to solve that for you. So I mentioned before that Kubernetes is declarative. And this is actually uh, a configuration file that you could use to create a MongoDB instance. And at the end of the session, I've, I've got a link to a white paper that actually steps through the, the whole process of, of building this out. And so the key here is that we've got MongoDB running in the container, and MongoDB is using a persistent volume. And so you can see that at the bottom there. Uh, pod is a, uh, it's a Kubernetes term, and a pod consists of one or more containers running on the same host. So in this example, we've just got a single container. And then that's part of a replication controller. So a replication controller is a job to make, its job is to make sure that you always have 20 Nginx servers running. In this case, we're going to use it to make sure that there's exactly one MongoDB instance running. And another mistake people sometimes make when they think about using Kubernetes with MongoDB is to say, I'm going to have a replication controller look after three uh, MongoDB instances. It doesn't work that way. Because remember, we want to be using external IP addresses. So that's why we've got the, the load balancer service running at the top. Its job is to load balance to a single, um, a single container, which is pretty easy. But the bit we really need is it provides a persistent external IP address. And so when we're connecting these MongoDB instances together to form a replica set, it's those IP addresses that we use. A nice side effect of that is you don't have to put each of these replicas in the same data center. And so, for example, if you're running on EC2, you could put them in different availability zones, different regions, diff different countries. Obviously, network latency can have an impact here. Right. When to use microservices? The simplest answer is where being quick is more important than being elegant. So this is the, I'm going to murder the pronunciation, but the Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. Uh, it was designed by Gaudi, and work started in 1882. And it's estimated that it's still 10 years away from being com uh, completed. But once it's completed, you can't argue that it's going to be a little more elegant than what we've got on the right-hand side. And in 500, times, 500 years' time, people will probably still be looking at that cathedral saying, yep, yeah, that's a thing of beauty. That's useful. Um, it's still standing today. On the right-hand side, probably not. Even over the next um, five years, they're probably going to replace some of the um, containers in there, sort of repair them, whatever. So you use microservices when you've got isolatable components of your application that you know you're going to frequently want to change in isolation, you want to upgrade them in isolation. Using the example on the right, if you're building an architecture where you're constantly going to be wanting to change the number of bedrooms that your house has, then this is a good option, because you can just tag on 
new bedrooms when you need them, remove them when you don't. And sort of there's, there's an argument that some people make that the only times you should use microservices is if you've got one of two problems. The first is that you need to scale your development team. So it's much easier to do if you break your problem down into small isolated components. Or that an overriding design goal is to have an architecture that uh, you can change easily. But sort of that may be a bit extreme, but that's, that's certainly an argument. Okay, use cases. I, I don't intend giving a huge amount of detail about each of what each of these people are doing, but it's more to give highlights of their motivation for going to microservices and for using uh, MongoDB with it. So we probably all know Gap, so I'll, I'll start there. So their main driver was flexibility. So they moved from a uh, monolithic application that looked after their purchase orders to a microservice one that used MongoDB. And that only took them 75 days, which sort of sometimes you're thinking if you're a startup that 75 days, that's, uh, that's years. But if you think you're taking an entrenched monolithic application and migrating to a completely rewritten architecture, you know, two and a half months, that's, that's not bad. And to demonstrate that they got the flexibility they were looking at, it, they can now implement new types of purchase orders in just a, a few days, where it used to take months and months to do. Interesting example is Fubo TV. So this is a North American site that streams football. So European football, South American football, and I, I guess maybe even some American uh, US soccer. And their big motivation is scalability. As you can imagine, they're streaming live football matches. So if it's the Champions League final, the World Cup final, they can see big spikes. So they can see 100x spikes in traffic during these big events. And so they needed an architecture that could scale with that. And if you are interested in running MongoDB itself inside of Kubernetes and Docker, it's good to go and look at that case study because th they are doing that. And it is, I think, still quite state of the art to do that, sort of leading edge state of the art, however you want to uh, look at it. Otto, so if you haven't heard of them, they're a very big uh, retailer in Germany. And their big motivation was aligning their architecture with their organization. And they're doing that so that they can have fast, iterative uh, delivery. Backcountry is a, uh, an online retailer that focuses in outdoor goods. Their motivated was that they had a, a growing and a growingly distributed development team. And so by splitting the software up into components, into containers, microservices, they could allocate a certain set of microservices to a particular development team, and they could work on that locally and efficiently. And then finally, uh, compare the market. That's an interesting case study to look at if you're interested in using microservices, MongoDB, and Apache Kafka, because they're doing exactly that. They have all of their applications written as microservices, and each of those microservices has its own local MongoDB instance or replica set. But they also recognize that there's some data that needs to be shared between them. So every time a change is written to the local MongoDB database, it's also written to Kafka. And from Kafka, they can run analysis on it. They can write it to HDFS, where they run batch, uh, batch analytics on it. And then the results can be written back to the operational databases. So, if you're interest, more interested in these, I'm, I'm not going to explain their architectures here today, but do go and look at the case studies, the, the blogs, Leaps in the Wild, that, that we have on these to, to find out more. And then finally, uh, a good place to get information on this is you can go to our blog, but we also have two uh, white papers that are dedicated to microservices. Uh, the second one goes into the real nitty-gritty detail. And for example, it does step you through how to create a replica set inside of Kubernetes. And then the second one is uh, a bit more business-oriented, so uh, convince your CIO that sort of embarking on this is, is worthwhile. 
and I don't have the link here, but if you go to our white, page, white papers page, uh, we also have one on using Kafka with, with MongoDB as well. So that's all I had. Do we have time for questions? I don't think we have mic runners, so. Yeah. Yeah. Andrew will answer your questions afterwards, yeah. and there will be many, because we've covered a lot of material there. So we're going to kick off the next session at 5 o'clock. Uh, that will be Ross Lawley, who is the driver engineer who has built our Spark connector. And he's going to talk about Spark and MongoDB. See you at 5 o'clock. Take a break. Thank you.